Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Schiffman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. Big day. We are recording the show on the actual opening day of Saratoga. Opening day at Saratoga. Happy opening day, Matt. This is the, of course, this is the most anticipated race meet of the year in American racing and Saratoga. We're excited like everybody else to get going with this great race meet in upstate New York's beautiful Saratoga Springs, Matt. Let's start with the race of the week. And of course, the race of the week is from Saratoga. Uh, Matt, we have a, a, you went actually into your time machine and you took this photo. Is this a photo of, of the Diana uh, discussion before the Diana? Well, it certainly could be, Brian. I th it's a photo from uh, uh, Belmont Stakes Day when Chad had four runners in the in the race for Peter Brandt. He's got four in the Diana, but only three for Peter Brandt. That's right. I was just going to ask our viewers if you are really paying attention because you know only three are Peter Brandt. When Peter Brandt, by the way, when Peter Brandt decided to get back in racing, he was a big name back in the day, but when he decided to get back in racing, he's done it in a big way. Now we get to the Diana and three of the four Chad Brown runners are owned by Peter Brandt, or at least a share owned by Peter Brandt. Uh, it looks like Chad Brown has a stranglehold on this grade one, half a million dollar race, nine furlongs on the turf, Matt. I have great memories of the Diana over the years. Six horse race, people are always going to complain with small field, but I tell you what, this is an awfully good six horse field led by the Brown foursome. It sure is, Brian. It, it's a six horse field, yes, but all of them are graded stakes or group stakes winner. Uh, this year, the race really has an international flair with uh, uh, five of the six horses being bred in Europe by uh, prominent sires from over there. I think Bleecker Street is the only American bred. Oh, she's a, she's a daughter of Quality Road, Matt. There she is, uh, Bleecker Street with a C. We apologize for that misspelling on this race graphic here. But Bleecker Street, of course, is undefeated in seven career starts, Matt. Only, she's only been running about 11 months. She made her debut last August as a three-year-old, and she's already seven for seven. Uh, the uh, morning line maker at Saratoga showed complete complete and utter confidence in the brown four here and bleaker street is the one he identified as the clear favorite and why not coming off a grade one win her first grade one win in the new york handicap where she rallied off a slow pace that day going a mile and a quarter to win the new york handicap and to make it seven for seven yeah there's a lot of interesting things to me about uh bleaker street and uh when I was writing my preview of the Diana for uh, Horse Racing Nation, I, to me, I said that I had the feeling that Bleecker Street is a horse that has really surprised Chad Brown, a horse that maybe he never expected to be this good, to be on a seven-race winning streak. And interestingly, uh, the, the next day in the preview that Naira put out about the race, uh, Chad Brown actually said that uh, he had been surprised by what Bleecker Street has done. He thought they bought her thinking that she was going to be a dirt horse. She never really loves training on the dirt and obviously took to uh, took to the grass starting her career at Monmouth Park and each race getting a little bit better and two starts last year, five starts this year, Brian, which is a lot for a Chad Brown horse. They've been evenly spaced out, but still a lot of starts for Chad. Yeah, and that might speak to what you said, that maybe at the beginning of the year, maybe when 2022 started, Chad Brown, seen pictured there, didn't think that uh, Bleecker Street was one of his big, big names on, uh, on his loaded uh, uh, turf female uh, roster. Matt, but I think it's a rule that all Chad Brown horses take to the turf, whether they ever actually try it or not. They just they just take to the grass. And sure enough, Bleecker Street has done that. She's looked really good. She's not blowing her fields out, but she just continues to prove, like uh, improve. And like I said, only 11 months into her career, and she is rolling. 
She's the horse to beat in here, Matt, but I really do think this is her toughest test to date. You got the other brown horses. Uh, before the other three brown horses, though, let's let's talk about the other two who are not brown horses. Dalica, uh, yeah, I agree. She'll be the clear underdog of the six, Matt. But she's a uh, Alstall Junior trained uh, mare who's who's won a bunch of stakes races. Yeah, that's for sure. And and uh, this is an interesting race. We talked about the six horse field. To me, uh, it looks like the field is is evenly divided with uh, three horses that really prefer to be racing on or near the lead and three horses that prefer to come off the pace which should make for which should make for an interesting race there's going to be should be an honest pace can any of them carry that uh uh carry their speed for the nine furlongs uh sure seems like it's going to set up for a closer but uh Delica is one of those horses that prefers to be on the lead, came back this year uh, and was second in the Mint Julep, a grade three at Churchill Downs um, after setting the pace. Yeah, yeah, that was a good performance from Delica. Uh, I do agree that she's a long shot. I do agree that she's one of the three uh, speed factors in here. And I'm kind of glad she's in the race because sometimes these New York races, especially when we have common interests. Uh, they don't always run as fast early as you hoped or as you handicapped for. So maybe Delica can help that happen with uh, other speed horses from the Brown Group, uh, technical analysis and in Italian also there. Now, Creative Flair uh, is the is the other non-Brown horse, Matt. And I tell you what, I look at this morning line and I am just kind of giddy over this morning line. I, I don't think she can possibly be eight to one. If she's eight to one, I am, uh, I'm going to make a quick uh, withdrawal from my local bank because I think Creative Flair has a huge shot in here for trainer Charlie Appleby. She's a Godolphin homebred, a European filly, also getting better and better. She came to America last year, Matt, and she ran in long races with slow paces, and I don't think that's her game. I think she's better going shorter. She looked awfully good. She beat good mares in Dubai earlier this year, nine furlongs. And interestingly, Matt, she was pretty close to that lead, and she pounced and took over the race early in the stretch. I think creative flair, she's coming off a bit of layoff. I would absolutely love eight to one because I think she has a shot to shock the Brown group. Well, we're talking about Charlie Appleby here and, and that alone uh, gives you a good chance. And, and last year, Charlie Appleby won the Diana breaking Chad Brown's five race winning streak in the Diana. And, and, and overall Chad has won it six times. He's going for a seventh with his quartet of runners. And so, yeah, I, I, I think, Creative flair is very interesting. A quality horse, gonna be good odds. That February layoff is a little bit of a concern. Yeah, although Charlie Appleby, I see it time and time again where they come back and they run kind of like some of our American trainers that we see do it here, like Chad Brown, for instance. Uh, yeah, Creative Flair. And again, she didn't run bad in those two big three year old Philly races in New York last year when she came to America. Uh, the time before, but uh, slower paces, longer distances, uh, I think she'll really be helped by the uh, nine furlong distance that uh, she prefers. And I think she has more speed than the other Brown Phillies. And that's, of course, Bleecker Street, who we all always talked about. But we need to talk about Rougier a little bit, Matt. Uh, she's co second choice here on the morning line. And Rougier was uh, a very good uh, three year old filly in France last year. Uh, Peter Brandt, Michael Tabor, I guess, uh, signed the uh, signed the papers to purchase her for better than three point three million last December. She's uh, in her new stable, Chad Brown, in America this year, and she's one for two. And it, we get a little bit of mixed signals there with those two performances so far in America for the highly respected, highly thought of French filly. Yeah, that's for sure, because she came out running for Chad uh, in her American debut, as so many horses do when she won the grade three bouquet. And that moved her into the group of Chad Brown runners that ran in the New York uh, grade one. Uh, um, after that, um, frankly, uh, you know, Rouge Deer uh, 
started the race, looked like uh, she was in great position, but coming down the stretch, just just didn't fire. A little bit of a head scratcher, a little bit curious. I think uh, Chad felt the same way about that performance. Um, he's bringing her back right away, you know, in a timely manner. So I have to assume that she's going to be ready to run a big race, maybe the kind of race we just draw a line through, because I certainly expected better from her uh, in that New York. Yeah, I've seen some uh, writing that maybe the cutback in distance from the mile and a quarter New York to the nine furlong Diana will be good for her. I'm not sure I buy that because she won the Prix de l'Opera last year at Longchamp, beating a very good field as a three-year-old uh, going longer. So I think it might have had more to do with the pace. The pace was slow, as I said, in the New York handicap. But Bleecker Street handled it. Rougier didn't. So maybe you're right. It just wasn't her day there, although she wasn't beaten by all that much, Matt. We're talking Chad Brown here, of course, when we talk about the Diana and we're talking Peter Brandt, but there's one filly that is not represented by those Peter Brandt colors in the Diana, and she's a good one. I just don't know if she's a grade one filly yet. She's also co-second choice. Technical analysis is on the rail. She's got good speed. She's got good history at Saratoga, and she's coming off a good win. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, uh, she was first in the Galleret down at Pimlico, I think, uh, on uh, Preakness weekend. Um, terrific record, nine starts, five wins, two seconds, one third, only one, you know, only one time out of the money. You mentioned Saratoga. Yeah, she won twice last year at Saratoga, so we know this is a place for her. Um, I agree with what you said, Brian. I don't know if she's at the grade one level uh, that others in this race seem more suited. Uh, she certainly is going to be part of the pace. She's another one of those horses that uh, wants to be on or near the lead. Right, right. As is in Italian and Dalica, as we've mentioned. I'm just not sold on her as a grade one filly. Uh, she came out to Kentucky last fall and Shanti Sarah treated her badly in the grade one uh, Queen Elizabeth's Challenge Cup here out of Keeneland. Uh, she was still second that day. She's a nice filly, but uh, with the other speed, might be a tough spot on the rail because the other speed's coming from the outside and Dalica in Italian has been a nice horse, only six career races. She's uh, uh, moved into graded stakes racing pretty well with a first, second or third. She's been beaten in her last two. I have a feeling she's a filly that will break through at some point in a big race. I'm just not sure if this is the day for her. Yeah, I agree, Brian. Uh, certainly a very nice filly. Uh, hit the board in all six of her races. Won the Honey Fox at Gulfstream Park earlier in the year. Um, again, I feel like maybe, you know, if, if there was one horse from the Chad group that they're putting in as a rabbit, you know, to ensure a fast pace, my feeling would be that it's in Italian. It could be. And with the common ownership, that might make a little bit sense. And with the fact that Rougier didn't get the pace she wanted last time in the New York handicap, uh, that might make even more sense. All right, Matt, that's our Diana preview and analysis. Let's get to the top picks. Are you ready, my friend? I'm going to let you go first. Absolutely, Brian. Hey, I've got tons of respect for Bleecker Street. And I'll be honest with you, Brian, I wouldn't mind seeing Bleecker Street win and continue with that winning streak. Because, you know, horses on long winning streaks like that, fans love them. They're good for the game. It's good to see a Chad horse running this often. But as we know, Brian, it's pretty rare when these win streaks keep on going and going and a horse ends their career uh, being undefeated. And, and like I mentioned earlier, um, this is going to be her sixth start this year. And, and maybe she'll just keep on doing it. And, and, you know, I'd be cool with that, but I got to take a shot uh, against that happening. She's going to be a heavy favorite in here. Uh, Irad has opted to stay on Bleecker Street. Of course, he, why would he change? Um, Chad Brown, Saratoga, she's going to get bet heavily. I'm going to take a chance that Rogier is going to get a much better pace and bounce back. Rogier is my top pick. Yeah, and I was a little bit surprised, not too surprised, because I, I, I knew the amount of hype that was following Rougier heading into the New York, but uh, 
I was a little bit surprised how heavily favorite Rougier was in the New York. But uh, after Bleecker Street beat her pretty good there, I, I think you're right. I think they're going to reverse. And I think Bleecker Street is a clear favorite in here. Rougier coming off that bad race. People people are fickle. People get off quickly. So uh, three to one, yeah, that, that sounds about right. Maybe even a little bit better. We'll see. Rougier, a big talent. And I think she's got a big shot, too. She's going to be one of the ones I use. But I'm doing the unthinkable. I'm I'm going against the Brown foursome in here. Uh, Charlie Appleby. Let's start a winning streak in the Diana for trainer Charlie Appleby. Maybe, maybe we can make this two in a row. I believe in creative flair. I, th I think she is... If she runs back to the race she did in Maidan in February, I know it's a bit of a layoff, but if she runs back to that race, I think she has a huge shot. I think she gets first run on the early leaders ahead of Rougier and Bleecker Street. And uh, I think she can do it. I think Creative Flair is that good. And we're going to see uh, a throwdown in the Diana. This would be a race where I'm not surprised if there are three or four horses within, oh, I don't know, half a length, three quarters of a length at the wire. But I like Creative Flair. I like her fighting spirit that she showed in Maidan. And I like the fact that she's got good experience already in America from last year. She'll be my top pick in the Diana. Matt, uh, of course, we want to talk more about Saratoga here on opening day, the start of the meet, the, 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 the best meet of the year. We both agree on that. And there's so much to look forward to. So we wanted to talk a little bit about what we have to look forward to. Where's our where's our cover photo for the? There it is, the cover photo for this week's show, Matt. And I bring up Epicenter because, of course, the Travers is always uh, kind of the centerpiece of the Saratoga meet. And uh, the Travers is definitely an interesting race. The Travers is a race that really has a good chance, I think, to decide who will be three-year-old champion. Uh, of course, there will be things that happen after the Travers, notably the Breeders' Cup. But the Travers, if we're talking about horses like Epicenter, who a lot of people think was the best horse that ran in the Triple Crown despite not winning one, early voting, the Preakness winner, Rich Strike, the Kentucky Derby winner, uh, and then you got the Brown horses. Maybe Jack Christopher wins the Haskell and moves on to the Travers. We'll see. But we expect early voting and Zandon to move on to the Travers. Uh, it, it's shaping up as a very good Travers, and the Travers is always fun to anticipate. Yeah, and don't forget Char uh, Charge It, who had that uh, fabulous performance in the Dwyer recently. I think the Travers is on his possible list. Oh, absolutely. I have, I'm not forgetting Charge It, Matt. He is, uh, he is perhaps my early pick for the Travers. Uh, Charge It could be any kind for trainer Chad. Chad. I'm on the Chad Brown uh, brain here. Uh, Todd <laughs> Fletcher, of course, that lightly raised son of Top It. Yeah, Charge It. Uh, we, we could see a creative minister. We could see a lot of horses in this Travers. It could be one of those big wide open fields that we've seen in the Travers over the years. And that is a race to look forward to. But coming before the Travers might actually be the race of the meet, Matt. That's that's the Whitney, the grade one Whitney. And, and the grade one Whitney usually isn't as big a field as the Travers, but often it uh, it attracts, if not the best older males in the country, some of the best older males in the country. And this year's Whitney uh, set for early August, Matt, less than a, a month away is looking like it's going to have some of the very best older males in the country. Yeah, some for sure. Maybe most of the, the top male horses. Of course, we're probably not going to see flight line. It seems like flight line is uh, going to stay out in California and uh, try 10 furlongs in the Pacific Classic after uh, after coming east and win the Met Mile, and fair enough with with that. Uh, uh, but yeah, what what a group in the, that are mentioning the Whitney as a possibility Olympiad for Bill Mott, who is on a winning streak and and just getting better and better. Of course, there's Life Is Good, who is just a, a brilliant and thrilling horse to watch, and and then. Our uh, friends, our three-year-old friends from last year, maybe Mandaloon, maybe Hot Rod Charlie, uh, along with a couple others from the Pletcher Barn. Yeah, let let me talk about Flightline real quick because there was a time where I thought Flightline, this race would make perfect sense uh, as a progression from the one mile met mile in early June. But I guess what they're doing, especially especially with that West Point ownership, they're they're uh, upstate New York guys. Terry Finley, uh, he he loves Saratoga, so I thought we might see Flightline, but that's okay that we're not. 
because the horses you mentioned, uh, I think it's shaping up really well. Olympiad is Bleecker Street as far as older dirt males because he's already won five this year and he's looked great. And if you had to pick a horse of the year today, if people are going to yell at me, how could you not pick Flightline? Flightline's run once, Olympiad's run five times and he's won them all. Olympiad has been a super horse for Bill Mott so far this year and is will be the horse to beat in the Whitney, but it's hard to pick against life is good. Todd Fletcher has a uh, has a bullet train in life is good, and he's coming off a nice return win last time, seven furlongs in the John Nehrut, of course, at Belmont Park. I like the fact that Hot Rod Charlie's finally not going to be one of the favorites in a race. It's been a while, but Hot Rod Charlie is really, really good still. I believe that, even though he's coming off a tough loss in the Salvatore Mile in his return rate. We're going to get some odds on Hot Rod Charlie, and I think nine furlongs is his distance. You mentioned Mandaloon as a possibility. Didn't run huge at Churchill, but a lot of class there. I'll mention Happy Saber as another horse possibly pointing for the Whitney because he's been really good. He's a horse people forget about, but in his first two starts, he ran a good second to Olympiad and then a good second to Flightline. So why forget about Happy Saber, a classy horse? Basically, Matt, it's shaping up as a great Whitney. Yeah, that's for sure. And I'm sure there will be others, you know, depending on uh, what happens in some of the prep races uh, uh, at Saratoga and around the country. Absolutely. Hey, Matt, I, I want to remind people if they haven't subscribed yet to our YouTube channel here at Horse Racing Nation, go ahead and do that. Turn on your notifications. You don't want to miss Matt Shipman and his partner. I, I guess that would be me anytime soon on Horse Center. We're here with you every week and we love doing it. All right, so the obvious races we're looking forward to. We're also looking forward to all the wonderful two-year-olds. Uh, uh, Jockey's Warrior looks to run twice here, but there's some other races we wanted to mention as well. I am, Matt, a, uh, a unabashed, uh, not, not so uh, shy about it. I'm a Secret Oath freak. Uh, Secret Oath is my favorite horse in training right now. And speaking of training, Matt, Secret Oath is training so well at Churchill Downs lately. I guess she's already moved to Saratoga now for trainer D. Wayne Lucas. But Secret Oath was just working so well after a tough trip fourth in the Preakness. I'm I'm still a little, uh, I, I got a needle in my foot on, on the trip she got in her two races against males. The Arkansas Derby when she was third and the Preakness went fourth. Uh, I don't think she would have won the Preakness even with a good trip, but I think she could have done a heck of a lot better if she just got the right trip. I'm excited seeing how well she has worked at Churchill Downs. It's, she's filled out. Uh, her frame, as D. Wayne Lucas tells us, and she is pointing for the Coaching Club American Oaks a week from Saturday, Matt. I'm excited to see that. Yeah, I'm excited too, and I will be especially excited if Nest shows up in the Coaching Club American Oaks also. Uh, uh, as we remember, what a great performance she put in when she finished second in the Belmont Stakes. So we're going to have these two marvelous three-year-old fillies coming back from starts against the boys and then knocking heads in the coaching club American Oaks. If it happens, that'll be quite a race. That'll be quite a race, uh, nine days away. I'm not sure if Nest is gonna show up there uh, coming out of the Belmont. Uh, she might wait for the Alabama, but if she does, I'm going on record right now, Secret Oath will bop Nest in the nose, Matt. Any comments on that? Um, I'm a big fan of Secret Oath, but I don't know. After that, after what I saw from Nest and the Belmont Stakes, I think it's a lot tougher race than maybe we thought it would be. Oh, yeah. Nest, Nest is good. Nest is good. I recognize that. But I think Secret Oath will beat her if they meet there. And maybe the, they won't. Maybe they'll meet in the Alabama. Or who knows? Maybe Secret Oath will try the Travers. Although I don't think so because her connections are same females the rest of the way. But I'm excited to see her in the Coaching Club American Oaks next next week uh, i'm also excited for the personal ensign uh early on i, I think clarier and malafat the two regally bred daughters of curlin are uh, now embroiled in a real rivalry now that clarier finally beat malafat um they they knocked heads last summer at saratoga and i want more you can't forget about latruska though i know she's thrown in a bad race in her last one and a bad race in the breeders cup but you just can't forget about the champion. So if we see those three from the Ogden fix, Phipps back in the personal ensign, throw in some other good ones, that's a race I want to circle on my calendar as well. 
Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, we saw it. We saw it at the end of last year that Claire Air looked like a horse that was getting better. And she certainly has. She's gotten better and better and better. That recent win was uh, terrific by Claire Air for trainer Steve Asmus. And Malathot is going to run in the V next weekend, uh, Todd Pletcher said, in preparation for the personal incident. And I sure hope we've got, we will get to see more of those wonderful performances from Latruska. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that's a good move, getting Malathot in the shoe V as a prep for the personal incident. Malathot's my early pick to turn the tables again on Clarier in that personal incident. And Matt, uh, again, you know, all these great two-year-olds, but we, we got to go with what we know right now. And I tell you what, the Travers is, is I already said it's going to be a big race, but before then is the Jim Dandy. And it's looking like both the two horses that were battling down the stretch in the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, Rich Strike went by him, but Epicenter and Zandon are two really good horses. And they both look like they're pointed for the Jim Dandy. Who knows? We might even see early voting there. The Jim Dandy in, in its own right could be a big race coming up much sooner than the Trappers. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, this, this three-year-old class is, uh, is exciting um, and most of them are back running and doing well. A lot of horses that we saw in the Kentucky Derby have come along and done things. A uh, 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 classic Causeway certainly being uh, certainly being one of them. I mean, we lost Mo Donegal, uh, uh, at least until the fall, but some pretty great horses. Yeah, and, and early voting, I'm not sure if uh, and uh, Chad hasn't committed about whether uh, he's going to run in the Haskell or wait and run in one of those races at uh, Saratoga. Yeah, and the Jim Dandy is one week after that uh, Haskell. And, of course, the Haskell will be our race of the week next week, Matt. So that's that's an exciting race as well, looking like a big field there at Monmouth Park. But that's our Saratoga early highlights preview, Matt, as well as the look at the Diana. Both Matt and I picked against the favorite Bleecker Street. We'll see if we can get her beat here, Matt. But for now, let me get a parting shot from you, my friend. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, hey, everybody, enjoy Saratoga. And uh, Del Mar will be opening up in a couple of weeks. I'm so used to Del Mar being open already, so it's a little weird. But uh, enjoy this great summer uh, racing. And as always, thanks for watching the show. Yeah, that's right, Matt. Del Mar used to open before Saratoga, but this week it is, uh, uh, I guess, eight days later. We have the ocean side, I want to say, a week from Friday as opening day at beautiful Del Mar there north of San Diego. Folks, uh, enjoy Saratoga. I know I know, so many of you listening now just wait for Saratoga uh, all year for 11 months or whatever it is, 10, 10 plus months every year. And Saratoga is upon us. Enjoy it whether you get there or not. It's great to watch these great horses at a great old racetrack in upstate New York. Good luck with your wagers there. I want to thank Candace Curtis for the race graphic. I want to thank Derby Wars, the best contest site out there. And I want to thank most of all you for watching every week here on Horse Center. We'll be back next week. We'll be talking Haskell next week right here on Horse Center. We'll see you then.